For the past 35 years, dietary fat, specifically saturated fat, has been demonized. We have dietary recommendations and guidelines that support the consumption of a low-fat diet. But in today's show, we're going to review six randomized controlled trials that do not support the dietary guidelines that have been foisted upon over 330 million Americans and about 60 million people in the United Kingdom. Drawing upon two recently published analysis of randomized controlled trials, and I want to really break this down because still so many people are scared of butter, scared of saturated fat, and are swapping out saturated fat and replacing that either with industrialized seed oils or carbohydrates like sugar. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there's really no evidence from randomized controlled trials showing that when you consume a low fat and specifically a low saturated fat diet, that there's any improvement or significant reduction in cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease mortality. The first paper that we're going to talk a lot about today is titled Evidence from Randomized Controlled Trials Do Not Support the Introduction of Dietary Fat Guidelines in 1977 and 1983 a systematic review and meta-analysis. Essentially, what these authors did is they looked at all of the different randomized controlled trials where individuals were randomized to either have a low saturated fat diet or a control group. And there's really weak if, and, and barely any evidence supporting and, and by the way, these trials, part of the inclusion criteria was that they lasted for more than a year. And so mortality and events were part of the outcomes here. Minimal differences in outcomes after one year, and this was in people who already had a primary event. They already had a myocardial infarction or heart attack. So even in these high-risk individuals, changing the fat content and decreasing saturated fat in the diet had minimal effect on cardiovascular disease-related events. We're going to dive in to these six RCTs in, involving 2,464 2, males, over six dietary trials, five secondary prevention studies, and one including healthy participants. And there were minimal differences between the deaths in the people that underwent a, a swapping of their dietary macronutrients, intentionally trying to minimize saturated fat intake in the diet uh, versus eating a normal uh, diet in terms of cardiovascular disease risk reduction and outcomes. We're also going to talk about this study right here titled Intake of Saturated Fats and Trans Unsaturated Fats and Risk of All-Cause Mortality, Cardiovascular Disease, and Type 2 Diabetes, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of observational studies. Now, this is looking at the observational studies that include epidemiological studies. So this is not specifically looking at RCTs, randomized controlled trials, where we can deduce a mechanism. That is, if there was a significant risk associated with consumption of saturated fat, an RCT would show that, that in fact, over the long haul, like a year-long study, that there was an increase in events or a change in events when that saturated fat was reduced. But essentially what this analysis shows is that contrary to prevailing dietary advice, authors of recent systematic reviews and meta-analysis claim that there is no excess cardiovascular risk associated with intake of saturated fat. And the U.S. has recently taken policy action to remove partially hydrogenated vegetable oils from its food supply. Population health guidelines require a careful review and assessment of the evidence of harms of these nutrients with a focus on replacing of nutrients. What this study adds, they say, well, there was no association between saturated fats and health outcomes in studies where saturated fat was generally replaced with carbohydrates, but there was a positive association between total trans fatty acids and health outcomes. Dietary guidelines for saturated and trans fatty acids must carefully consider the effects of replacement nutrients. So what this adds, trans fats are problematic, but saturated fats are not necessarily problematic, especially because when you start to eat a diet low in saturated fats, you replace them oftentimes with refined carbohydrates or industrial seed oils, canola, soy, rapeseed oil, cottonseed oil, etc., which are unhealthy. So let's further dive into this because I think this is really important. Many people are still being very proactive about reducing the saturated fat intake in their diet based upon low quality evidence. And we're going to review that evidence right now. But first, I just want to say thank you for being here. If you're enjoying this content, please hit that like button. Please subscribe to this channel and leave me a comment in the comment section below about what you've personally noticed when you're changing the macronutrient contents in your diet. Has your health improved or regressed if you increase or decrease your saturated fat intake? I'm very curious to know. Now, since we're talking about metabolic health, a tool that can help you is the Berberine Fasting Accelerator by Myoscience. This is a great way to help curb those evening food cravings for cookies, wine, alcohol, 
uh, sugar, such as ice cream and some of the treats that are very prevalent this time of year with the holiday season coming up. If you're susceptible like me to consuming these items, check out myoscience.com. See the many reviews on the Berberine Fasting Accelerator. You can take two to three capsules in the evening to help curb your food cravings and kickstart your fast. And that's a great way to actually, you know, decreasing your food intake before bedtime, improve sleep quality, sleep duration, and may also help reduce visceral fat gain over time. So you can save with the code podcast over at myoscience.com. So let's dive into this and talk about the history of the creation of the dietary guidelines that have been foisted upon all of us based upon low quality evidence. The scientists say U.S. public health dietary advice was announced by the Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs in 1977 and was followed by U.K. public health dietary advice issued by the National Advisory Committee on Nutrition Education in 1983. The dietary recommendation in both cases focus on reducing dietary fat intake specifically, number one, to reduce overall fat consumption by 30% of total energy intake, and number two, reduce saturated fat consumption to 10% of total energy intake. The most comprehensive population study undertaken was a seven-country study by Ansel Keys. Many of you know Ansel Keys. If you've read the book, The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholtz, a past podcast guest, we dive into Ansel Keys. I want to just give Keys credit for the human starvation studies that have been conducted at University of Minnesota. But his seven-country studies were an observational study of different countries in the Mediterranean region. And this reported that cardiovascular disease tended to be related to serum cholesterol values. That was the main finding of his studies, and these in turn tended to be related to the proportion of calories provided by saturated fats in the diet, Key said, but he also acknowledged that epidemiological studies could reveal relationships, but not causation, and that's why we need randomized controlled trials to provide the best quality evidence. Hence, this analysis of six RCTs that have been conducted prior to the implementation of these dietary guidelines, which is a great way to see, you know, there's no bias infused in this. This was really before fat was demonized at scale. So it's important to acknowledge this. Now, the scientists go on to say no randomized controlled trial has tested government dietary fat recommendations before their introduction. Recommendations were made for 276 million people following secondary studies of 2,467 males, which reported all-cause mortality. Randomized controlled trial evidence do not support the introduction of dietary fat guidelines. We're going to break this down shortly. Inclusion criteria for this analysis, there was 98 studies that were part of this review. Only six met these, the following inclusion criteria. There were randomized dietary intervention studies, supported hypothesis relating to a reduction or modification of dietary fat or cholesterol. Participants were human adults, not animals. There's a lot of animal model studies, rat studies, and so forth. You are not a rat. You're not a mole. So, and also another aspect of this inclusion criteria was the study was at least one year in duration. And finally, that we have data on all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality and cholesterol measurements were available. So let's break down these different studies, okay? The names are probably not relevant to you, but in case you're a science nerd, here they are. The Rose Corn Oil Study, the Rose Olive Oil Study, the Research Committee on Low Fat, the MRC Soybean Oil Study, the LA Veterans Study, and the Oslo Heart Study, as well as the Sydney Heart Study. Okay, so these were all conducted, randomized controlled trials involving humans lasting at least one year duration, and they looked at outcomes, including death and cardiovascular disease-related challenges. Okay, so what do we have here? So if we look at the analysis of these six different randomized controlled trials with the inclusion criteria that I just mentioned, there was 1,227 people in the intervention group and 1,240 people in the control group. There were a total of 370 deaths in the intervention group and the control groups. So the deaths were about the same. The all-cause mortality was 30% in the intervention group and 29.8% in the control group. So this is not statistically significant. There was not significant differences in the mortality over the course of all of these different studies that lasted more than one year. The mean death rate was high reflecting the fact that these studies were secondary prevention studies, except for the combined primary and secondary prevention in the LA veteran study. Unsurprisingly, death rates were higher in the longer term studies, as of course, if you follow people over a longer period of time, more people are going to die. The lowest death rate was observed in the control group in the Rose et al. study. And this was the Rose corn oil study. Okay. So essentially what that means is that 
The control group, remember, didn't have any dietary intervention in terms of lowering saturated fat or total fat in the diet. So we would not expect if saturated fat or total fat were problematic and exacerbated cardiovascular disease, we would be surprised to learn that the control group had a lower death rate compared to the intervention group. So that does not support the hypothesis that dietary saturated fat and total fat intake exacerbate cardiovascular disease. The scientists go on to say three studies and the olive oil intervention reported no significant differences in deaths. The corn oil deaths were reported as significantly different in favor of the control group, as I recently mentioned. Okay, Lauren et al. reported that, that the differences in all-cause mortality were not statistically significant. The p-value was 0.35. And as I mentioned, the all-cause mortality, looking at the controls versus the people that were in the intervention arms, were 30.2% in the intervention, meaning they changed their diet versus the control group. It was just 29.8%. So we're talking about uh, 04 percent difference here, and that is not significantly significant. Now, if we hone in specifically on cardiovascular disease mortality, the total cardiovascular disease mortality was 79 out of 206 men in the diet group and 94 out of 206 men in the control group, and this was not statistically significant. So you can see the scatter plots here. These are known as forest plots, and you can see here which study favors intervention versus control, and they some of them slightly favor uh, the intervention. Some of them favor more of the control. And when you weigh out all the significance of the effect size in these different studies, there's not statistically significant differences in supporting the fact, supporting the notion that dietary fat and saturated fat cause heart disease. Okay. So the scientists say in their conclusion, the main findings of the present meta-analysis of the six randomized controlled trials available at the time of issuing dietary guidelines in the U S and the UK indicate that all cause mortality was identical at 370 in the intervention and control groups. There were no statistically significant differences in deaths from cardiovascular disease. The reduction in mean serum cholesterol levels were significantly higher in the intervention groups. This did not result in significant differences in cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality. It is a widely held view that reductions in cholesterol are helpful per se but that is not corroborated by the evidence. And we actually reviewed a recently uh, published study finding that total serum cholesterol increases the likelihood or probability that you will live to see your 100th birthday. And, and that is contrary to popular guidelines. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that we need to revisit these ideas that we have accepted to become true, that dietary cholesterol and saturated fat are harmful and high cholesterol is harmful and it should be reduced all the time. And that is not really being corroborated by the evidence. The authors say the original randomized controlled trials do not find any relationship between dietary fat intake and deaths from cardiovascular disease or all causes, despite significant reductions in cholesterol levels in the intervention and control groups. This undermines the role of serum cholesterol levels as an intermediary to the development of cardiovascular disease and its sequela. Deductions can be made about the dietary interventions and mortality from all causes and cardiovascular disease. The rose et al. interventions most notably favor the control group in both forest plus Plots, but the wide confidence intervals render these, as with all the studies, non-significant. Only one study made a positive claim for its interventions after five years and subsequently was moderated. Rose et al. warned of possible harm by administering corn oil. Now, it's curious because the research committee back in 1977 that was conducted in front of the Senate to foist the dietary guidelines on America concluded a low-fat diet has no place in the treatment of myocardial infarction. The MRC Soya bean oil intervention found no evidence that myocardial infarction relapse would be materially affected by unsaturated fat in the diet. The LA Veterans study reported that total longevity was not affected and expressed concern about unknown toxicity of their intervention. Woodhill et al. noted that survival was significantly better in the control group than the diet group. So in conclusion, the researchers say from the literature that is available, it is clear that at the time dietary advice was introduced, 2,467 men have been observed in randomized controlled trials. No women had been studied. No primary prevention study has been undertaken and no RCT has tested the dietary fat recommendations. No RCT concluded that dietary guidelines should be introduced. It seems incomprehensible that dietary advice was introduced to 220 million Americans at that time. That was a population of the U.S. and 50 
56 million UK citizens back in 1982. This was a population of the UK. Given the contrary results from only a small number of unhealthy men who have already had a heart attack. An exchange between Dr. Robert Olson of St. Louis University and Senator George McGovern, chair of the Dietary Committee, was recorded back on July 1977. Olson said, I pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. McGovern replied, senators do not have the luxury that research scientists does in waiting until every last shred of evidence is in. Essentially, we have a health professional who is doing academic research who pleaded with a politician to maybe wait until we have more evidence before foisting this sweeping act of you know nutrition advice onto millions of people. And the politician said, we don't have time to wait. We need to act now. Now, you might say, well, what have we done in terms of making a dent in reducing cardiovascular disease mortality? Well, if you look at the, st the CDC's own statistics every year, more than 600,000 people die from cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease-related complications. It's fair to say that our dietary advice and recommendations haven't done much in terms of reduce the prevalence and incidence and numbers of deaths and premature deaths from cardiovascular disease. So I think it's fair to say that these recommendations were foisted upon us using low quality evidence. And it's time that we actually look at the evidence some 35 years later to see if there really was good evidence to uh, initiate these uh, dietary recommendations in the first place. And it appears that there is not. Now, that being said, there are still millions of people who believe saturated fat is problematic who are scared of butter, who are scared of red meat, who are scared of cholesterol. They are, afraid, they are afraid to have egg yolks because they wrongly believe that dietary cholesterol will increase serum cholesterol and that somehow serum cholesterol is problematic, which we know it not to be. So friends, that is a review of the recently published uh, research and commentary from people who are doing advanced analysis of the randomized controlled trials, looking at dietary interventions as it relates to cardiovascular disease. I'm grateful that you tuned in all the way. I would love to know what you thought about this video, and I will link these studies below so that you can share them with your friends and family who are swapping out healthy fats with processed industrial seed oils and or refined carbohydrates and noticing their health is actually worsening, which is not what the dietary guidelines were intended to do, actually. We want to prevent diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, but many people are inadvertently giving themselves these very conditions that they're trying to prevent by listening to obsolete dietary advice. So that's it for today, friends. As always, I appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for subscribing. We'll catch you in a future episode down the road.